Good morning, members, friends of Calvary. We're very happy to have you joining us in worship today as we fulfill our uh, privilege of serving Jesus Christ, of encouraging one another in our faith as we walk this Christian life together. For announcements today, you'll see the insert in the bulletin regarding the CAT survey. Uh, we have two more weeks to complete that, and I encourage you, if you have not yet, to uh, get that completed. It's uh, important data as we look forward toward the future of the church. There is a reward of a Kit Kat bar if you get yours completed, so um, you can see Jamie about that, I believe, or Keith would have those available. So I completed mine online, so I have to get in touch with them after church since I did not go trick-or-treating and I do not have any Kit Kat bars uh, sitting in my kitchen. So uh, we ask you can prayerfully consider how you complete that. Uh, do it honestly. It is an anonymous survey, so no one will know what you say or connect you with anything and um, give your honest appraisal of how we think uh, we'd like the church to move forward. Also encourage you to uh, prayerfully consider your vote. If you have not already voted early, consider what the uh, biblical counsel would be and pray before you make those decisions. We are so privileged to live in a country where we can speak our mind and uh, cast our votes. But uh, we just pray that you'll do that prayerfully and with a biblical uh, attitude in mind. A couple of things just coming up uh, in the month of November that we're excited about. Uh, there will be another Calvary Cafe hosted by Friends at Friendship Arc on the 19th. You can come in and get some specialty drinks that I think will be kind of holiday themed as I understand it. And it's a great way for our church to connect one-on-one uh, -on -one with our friends from Friendship Arc as that is one of our mission focuses. And I can say, um, as a beneficiary of that on the Friendship Arc side with both children and work, that it is really just a, a lovely morning. They have so much fun putting that together. So if you're free for a good cup of coffee on the 19th, we invite you to come with that. And also uh, the church will be hosting the Friendship Arc Friendsgiving. So we just want to thank you so much for partnering with us as we serve adults with intellectual disabilities. That's a very exciting time for everyone, especially some who don't go home with family, who get a chance to uh, enjoy a good Thanksgiving meal together. So thank you for sharing our facilities with them. Uh, we are looking at potentially um, trying to work up some numbers with the hand chimes that have been donated to the church several years ago. And so if there's any interest in that, you don't feel you can sing, but you feel you could uh, ring a chime, let me know. We're going to try to incorporate that a little bit into the choir this year. So if there's something that you would like to participate in uh, musically, but you don't feel you can carry a tune, um, please let us know. We'd love to have you participate in that. So that's something you can see me about later and is there anything else I did not cover that should be covered I see nothing extra so I will uh, greet you as a call to worship from Psalm 9 I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart I will tell of all your wonders I will be glad and exult in you, and I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. And that's what we're going to do this morning with number 371. We are standing amazed in the presence, and how wonderful, how marvelous is Jesus' love for us. So let us sing of that together, number 371, verses 1, 4, and 5. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, had my soul shall ever be. Savior's love for me. He
may be seated. Good morning. Got a loose tooth. Oh my. Well, you know, it's kind of dark and dreary out there today. But the sunshine on your faces makes it a lot brighter. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Say, if you have really, really good news, do you like to stay quiet and keep it to yourself? No? no. Do you like to tell people about it? Yeah. As long as, long as people say you can tell it. If they say it's a secret, don't tell it. Oh, that's right. Very good. Yeah, if they tell you a secret and tell you to keep it secret, you shouldn't tell anybody else. But you know, there's, there's some good news that we have that Jesus says we should go and tell everybody. So he says, we're not supposed to keep it secret. Do you, do you know what that good news is? That good news is that God loves us and he wants to save us from our sins, from the bad things we do, from the things that uh, we say that aren't very good. So he wants to save us from all that and he wants us to tell other people that we're saved and they can be saved too. Isn't that good news? We call that the gospel. And that should be something that we really, really want to do. We should be wanting to tell everybody about this because uh, it's the best news in the world and they need to hear it so that they can know Jesus too and be saved. So uh, think about that when you are uh, at school or um, just hanging around with your friends or uh, anywhere you go, you can tell them about the good news of Jesus. Now sometimes they won't want to hear it and so we got to be sensitive. If they don't want to hear it, we need to respect that. But, you know, uh, people need to hear it and um, if they're willing to listen, we should tell them about Jesus. Let's pray. Well, thank you um, for these young ladies this morning. And we're so glad that they're here. And we so glad, or we're so glad that you love them and they love you. And uh, they brighten our day here in this church. Lord, I pray that you'll help us, all of us, to... Um, Share this good news that we have, that you love us and that you want what's best for us and you want to have a relationship with us. So help um, all of us to, to know that and to share that good news with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming today. I thank you. Scripture lesson today, our gift from the Word of God for this morning is Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. 
In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the word of the Lord, and this we believe. Well, what is your burning ambition? Uh, I I find that I have um, reached the age where my burning ambition is just to be able to get out of bed in the morning uh, without any further aches and pains. Uh, But, you know, I have had higher ambitions than that in my lifetime. Uh, What is it uh, that makes you want to get up in the morning, that, that lights you up, that energizes you. My cup of Maybe your primary ambition uh, was to be the best in your chosen career or to pull down a six-figure income by the time uh, you retired and to have a sizable pension uh, by the time you retired so that you could travel and, and do all the things that you wanted to do. Uh, we Christians... Uh, often have ambitions that are unique to us. Uh, Some of us want to be part of the largest church in town with the most programs for people to be involved in. Some of us have ambitions in the opposite direction. We want to be in small churches. You're you're here in this small church. We want to have that family feeling and we want uh, that family welcome. And so we all have different ambitions. While these ambitions are not necessarily wrong, uh, the Apostle Paul has a greater ambition in mind for himself and for the rest of the church. Paul's burning ambition was to take the gospel to those who had not heard it before, uh, to reach the unreached people of the world. And as Paul shares his unique ministry to the Gentiles in Romans 15, verses 14 through 21, he invites us to share that ambition as well, to extend Christ's kingdom to places where the the kingdom hasn't been heard of. Now, on the surface, this section of the letter seems to be just Paul uh, recounting Uh, what he has done, talking about his ministry, telling them why he was writing the letter in the first place. But below the surface, we get a glimpse of the heart of the gospel ambition. As Christians, our ambition should be to take the gospel beyond the walls of our little church, to take it to the world that desperately needs to hear this message. And that's the example that Paul has set and invites us to follow. In verse 14, Paul affirms the church in Rome. He's writing to Rome, uh, the church in Rome, and he's heard great things about it. He hasn't been there himself, but he is satisfied that they are full of goodness, he says. He is convinced that they are a church that bears the marks of a true Christian that he outlined back in chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. They're doing all the right things. They, 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 they have all of the right uh, relationships going on. Their love is genuine. They generally treat each other with goodwill. And they have a good attitude towards outsiders. It's it's evident that they are a church 
that is shaped by grace. They are also a church that is filled with all knowledge. The perfect tense of the the verb makes it most likely that Paul means that they are, are being filled with knowledge. It's not that they know everything. Um, It's that they are continually learning, that they are building um, towards this full knowledge. And so they are, they're even hungry for knowledge. Uh, They want to learn more. They want to learn more about Jesus. They want to learn more about, you know, the kingdom of God. And so um, it's very commendable that they're not just sitting on what they already know and and just relaxing and, and basking and um, God's approval. What they know increases their appetite for learning more. And they are able to instruct one another in matters of faith. So not only do they know things about the, the faith, they also share it with others. And they do it competently. So this is a church that has a lot of things going for it. It's a commendable church. But no matter how good a church is, you can always get better. Because churches are filled with imperfect people, aren't they? Paul felt as if he needed to write to them very boldly on a few points, he says. Among his bold words were the implied rebukes of the, to the boastful Jewish Christians in chapters 2 and 3. I don't know if you can remember that far back when we covered that, but uh, uh, the Jewish Christians tended to be um, judgmental, judging those uh, outside the church, judging uh, the Gentiles even inside the church. And he uh, rebukes the, them, and he also challenges the arrogant Gentile Christians in chapter 11. The exhortations in chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 and the very specific situations and instructions in chapter 14 and the first part of chapter 15 all um, are, are very bold words that challenge this church to get better, that there, there's room for improvement. But then again, uh, who does Paul think he is writing so boldly to this church? Why should they listen to him? He's, he's never been to this church. Um, he's not one of their local pastors. Um, why should they listen to him? It's not who Paul thinks he is, but who he knows he is that's important. Way back in the greeting of the letter, he introduced himself as an apostle set apart for for the gospel of God. He has the authority to write boldly to this uh, church that he's never been to because of the grace given to him by God. Verse 16, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's a trend today among some people to disregard Paul, uh, cut him off from Scripture, to only uh, focus on the Gospels, and, we, and they say we can ignore Paul. We can't. Paul has the authority given by God, by the grace of God, um, to speak with authority, and his, his letters, these letters we have of his, are part of Scripture. So Paul's mission, given to him by God's grace, was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He was to go to the Gentiles throughout the known world and proclaim the gospel to them and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ so that Christianity would be more than just a Jewish sect. It wasn't supposed to be limited to just one set of people. 
In bringing the Gentiles to God through Jesus Christ, Paul was performing a priestly service, he said. And one of the priestly duties in the Old Testament was to offer sacrifices to God. But Paul does not see himself as a Jewish priest who offers burnt offerings to God. He's not offering meat sacrifice to God. He's not offering grain offerings. He's offering the Gentiles. He's offering the Gentiles to God. So when he proclaims the gospel, the, the Gentiles receive it. They respond to it they, with the affirmation. They receive Jesus. And Paul is then bringing them as living sacrifices to God. He's saying, these, these people are yours. And, and so uh, do with them what you will. And it's Paul's hope that the offering of these Gentiles to God will be acceptable to him, that they will be sanctified, made holy by the Holy Spirit. And this is accomplished entirely by grace. Paul can't make the Gentiles holy. He simply can bring them to God who can. To this end, Paul appealed to the Roman Christians in chapter 12, verse 1, by God's mercy to offer their bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Paul was appealing to them to willingly complete the sacrifice that he was uh, offering to God, that he had initiated. And Paul's passion here is not just to offer individuals to God. I mean, each individual is important, but what he wants to do uh, is bring a community, a a holy community to God. So it's a a brand new um, society that he is bringing. He isn't one of those who keeps score of how many people he has brought to Christ. Sometimes you hear uh, people say, well, you know, I I shared the gospel with 10 people today and they all came to know Christ. We used to call those spiritual scalps. And so uh, he's not doing that. He's not keeping count of how many Gentiles he's bringing to God. He's thinking in, in, in the entirety. His aim is to offer the Gentiles collectively as a church saved, shaped by grace. His plan is not to bring the Gentiles to God to make a name for himself. He's not saying, look, God, what I, all I'm doing for you. His passion is to, to make that connection, Gentiles and God bringing them together. He's offering the Gentiles to the one who created them and to whom they already belong. So, Thinking of that, thinking that Paul isn't, isn't trying to make a name for himself with God, that brings us to verse 17, which seems rather out of place when you think about Paul's ambition. Paul writes something that, that might trouble us at first. It says, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. So if his ambition isn't to make a name for himself, what is this pride? Why is he proud of his work for God? Is this something that um, he's bragging about, that he's somehow boastful about? The Bible is filled with warnings against pride. We get a sampling of God's attitude towards pride in three verses of the Old Testament book of Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. That's Proverbs 11.2. Proverbs 16.18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29.23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. So isn't it wrong for Paul to be proud of his work for God? It would be 
if Paul is thinking of something that he is doing under his own power. Look at what he writes in verses 18 and 19. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to, the, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So note that it was, it was God working through Paul. It was God's power. It was the Holy Spirit's power that enabled him to speak the gospel and to speak the gospel in a way that would um, convince people and convert people. Paul couldn't do it on his, own, on, on his own strength. The Holy Spirit had to do it. And it was God who gave him the ability through the Holy Spirit to do signs and wonders to back up what he was saying. So Paul's saying, I, I, I'm proud of the fact that I said uh, yes to God, that I uh, am doing what God has called me to do, but it's God's power that's, that's doing that. He's not taking any credit for himself. So his pride was in the, the words that the Holy Spirit enabled him to speak that were effectual. It was, he was proud of the power of, the, of God to give him the ability to do signs and wonders. Only what is said and done in the power of the Holy Spirit has the power to bring anyone into the kingdom of God. And Paul was proud that he was able to carry the gospel message backed by God's power throughout the known world to the Gentiles who hadn't had an opportunity to hear it before. That was Paul's gospel ambition, to reach unreached people so that they would become followers of Jesus Christ. We know that because he tells us explicitly in verses 20 and 21, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So his burning ambition is to, to, to go where no one has ever gone before. Borrow a Star Trek thing. It's what got him up in the morning. It's what charged his batteries. He wanted people to know the joy of knowing and following Jesus. And he wanted God to be glorified by, by bringing the Gentiles into his kingdom. Paul's gospel ambition was to be a pioneer rather than a settler. You know, the, the pioneers went out and they, they uh, discovered the land. The, the, the settlers came afterwards and settled in the land. But the pioneers were always going forward, going out. He didn't want to build on another person's foundation, he said. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There are people that, that need to, to be left behind. And he, uh, when he did his missionary travels, he did leave uh, some of his companions behind to, to teach and to build up what uh, was established, building up the church. But his gospel uh, ambition, his understanding of his calling was to go where people hadn't heard. He was driven to get the message to the frontier. So how does this apply to us? This, uh, isn't this all about Paul? Well, yes, Paul's ministry was unique. He was an apostle. Uh, we don't have apostles, at least in that sense, uh, anymore with the authority that he has. But it applies to us because, sadly, I think many of us in the American church do not have that gospel ambition 
to take the gospel where it hasn't been heard. We've allowed worldly ambition to overcome our gospel ambition. For too many of us pastors, uh, we, our ambition is to, to go to an established, big, well-known, successful church and, and to build on that and build our own reputations. The, the ambition of many lay leaders and church members is to provide programs uh, that will tickle their fancy, that will uh, please them, that will build themselves up <clears throat> and keep people there who are already there happy. We don't seem concerned that there are vast numbers of people who haven't heard or haven't understood the gospel. We need to trade our ambition to be successful and to be comfortable for the more godly ambition to take the gospel where it hasn't been heard. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to be called like Paul to to go into foreign lands um, to share the gospel. Some will. Most of us in our uh, life situation now um, we're, we're past that. But you know, uh, we don't necessarily have to take uh, the gospel uh, overseas in order to reach unreached people. Especially living in a university town the size of Iowa State, the world is coming to us. And so we have that opportunity to share the gospel with those uh, who are here in Ames. And we have uh, the opportunity to even share uh, with the gospel with people who haven't understood it yet. They may have heard it, but they haven't really been challenged to respond to it. And we also have the uh, opportunity, perhaps, uh, to share uh, our financial resources with those people who are going overseas, who are sharing the gospel cross-culturally. So even if we don't feel called to do it personally, we have the opportunity to share uh, resources with those who do have that calling. So what is your ambition? What is your, your burning ambition in life? Your ambition may, be, may not be the same as Paul's to preach the gospel where no one else has heard. And there's no shame in building on someone else's foundation. But as we are building on that foundation, we should always be looking beyond the frontiers of our ministries to the unreached people uh, around us and beyond us. In our neighborhood, in our world, uh, wherever the gospel uh, has not been heard. We should be encouraging those who are disciplining or discipling it to consider taking the gospel to the unreached people in the world. We should be a sending church. So often we want to keep uh, those people who are uh, precious to us and keep them to ourselves rather than saying, maybe you're called to take the gospel somewhere else. And we should be encouraging those who aren't called to be frontline workers in reaching the unreached to support those people who are called, not only with our money, but with our prayers, because prayers are so effectual, so important. In chapter 10, Paul wrote that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he asked, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? If no one has the ambition to reach the unreached people of the world, those who have never heard, then how will they be saved? 
they have never heard of Jesus, they're not going to be able to respond to Jesus. That should break our hearts. I know it breaks God's. So that's a question that really should shape our ambition to take the gospel where it's never been heard. Let's pray. Great and awesome God. Um, what an amazing God you are. Our creator, our sustainer. You are the one in whom we live and move and have our being. You are the, you are the breath that we take. You cause our heart to beat. You are worthy of our worship, Lord. And you have filled us with abundant blessings. And Lord, in response to that, we ask that you will forgive us for not sharing how great you are with other people, especially those who haven't heard of you. Forgive us for being satisfied with our cozy little Christianity their cozy little beliefs. Forgive us for, for hogging all of the good news to ourselves and not sharing it beyond our, our homes, beyond our church. I pray that you'll give us this gospel ambition. If we don't go personally to, to sh share our resources with those who are going and to Pray fervently for those who are taking the gospel where it's not been heard before. Lord, we, we, we pray that desperately, asking that you will make us instruments that will enable more and more people to come into your kingdom. And Lord, as we um, move to the communion table, we ask that you will um, penetrate our hearts. You will search our hearts. Hear our words of confession so that uh, we can come worthily, that we can come with clean hearts and clean hands and to your table. And so, Lord, we, we take a moment now just to, to pray individually to you, confessing our sin, confessing our known sin, and uh, receiving your blessing. Let us all pray. Hear the good news from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness you have given us through Jesus Christ. And it is through that powerful name that we pray the prayer that he um, gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we uh, prepare for communion, I invite you to join in singing this communion hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. had Passover with his uh, disciples. And during the Passover meal, he reinterpreted the Passover uh, because really the Passover was about him, as the whole Old Testament was about him. And when he came to the moment for the breaking of bread, he took the bread. And he gave thanks to his heavenly Father. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup cup of thanksgiving, the cup of praise, and he gave thanks to his heavenly Father, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this together, do it in remembrance of me. So that's what we do. We continue to remember Christ's sacrifice for us. But we don't do it in a somber way. We do it with thanksgiving and joy because of that sacrifice. We can come with our sins forgiven and come into God's presence. Just a reminder, uh, you do not have to be a member of the United Methodist Church or this particular church in order to join with us in communion. We just ask that you be a follower of Jesus and that you love Jesus and you love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, I would ask Gary to uh, dismiss you by uh, Rose. You can come up to the communion rail and uh, kneel or stand, whichever is comfortable for you. I will give you the uh, communion elements and uh, if you would hold them until we uh, partake together, that would be great.
you'll hold in your hands the representation of Christ's body. This bread is Christ's body, broken for you, that you might be healed of your sin. Take and eat in remembrance of him. And this is Christ's blood shed for us to cleanse us from all our sin, take and drink in remembrance of him. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, I think, today uh, gives us some foundation for that gospel ambition that Steve preached about today. And in Paul's uh, very next letter, or at least the next one in our New Testament, he writes this. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is a simple message that we celebrated with communion today and that uh, we have heard about with gospel ambition and the foundation of everything that we preach and share in the name of Jesus and because we love him is found um, in that simple phrase, I know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that is the theme of our hymn number 163, Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know. What delights me, what stirs me, what sends me with that ambition is Jesus Christ the crucified. So number 163, I invite you to stand. May the God of endurance and encouragement 
grant you to live in such harmony with one another that together in accord with Christ Jesus, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.